I am grateful for everybody who is joining us in the third week of this series called Cuffing Season. Now, I want to go ahead and admit that this series causes a lot of um, pain. If you're actually listening to this series with your heart open, this one hurts a little bit. Okay. Now, some of y'all just watch it like, let me see what's about to happen. Your heart is closed. It's fine right now. I'm asking you to open your heart because in week three, I just want to let you know the two past weeks were the warm up. (laughs) The level of revelation and clarity that God is giving me on this series about being cuffed to things that we love that don't love us back. The things that we've been doing since we were young. The things that we say and we think we're being funny, but we're actually tearing down our future. Uh Uh-oh. The ideas that we embrace around our family and familiar people that are actually robbing us of the future that God has planned for us. We've been cuffed to things that are killing our calling. And so many people want to know God's will for your life and want to know, like, what what has God called me to do? The truth of the matter, many times the answer is not in what you pick up. The answer is in what you let go of. (laughs) And I just want to come help somebody because a lot of people have been praying for God to do something. And God's asking you to let go of something. You don't have enough room to receive new vision. Uh Uh-oh. You don't have enough freedom from certain things to actually be able to invest in the next thing that God has called you to do. And so I believe it's my assignment over this series. And I don't know, we might do this series for for real 20 weeks. I don't know, like, because the level of C words that I have (laughs) that correlate with the Bible right now is tremendous. Do you hear me? I got cuff into everything. Because I keep seeing it in people's life, and I'm tired of the body of Christ losing winning battles. I'm going to say it to this side. I am tired of the body of Christ losing when the fight is already fixed. You are supposed to win this. But the truth is that many of us are cuffed to things that have become, let me say it in a biblical term, idols. See, an idol is not just a statue that people worship. An idol is anything that has taken the place of God. Okay? So for some of you, you have idols that you birthed. Some of you have idols that you live in. Some of you have idols that you drive. Some of you have idols that are celebrities. Some of you, it's taken the place of God. When they say do it, you obey. Okay, let me stop. When, 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 they, when they say lift your hands to give an offering, you pay a hundred and something dollars for the ticket. What do y'all think they do at concerts? And every time you go in there, everybody put your book of book of hands up. What, what is this the sign of? Surrender. Y'all, y'all don't. At, at every game when they score a goal, grown men with their shirts off, painted blue on one side, red on the other. He's a lawyer during the week. But a fanatic on the weekend doing what? Giving, serving, making time for, in community with. Uh oh. It has become an idol. And what God is saying in this series, he said, this is a deliverance series that I want you to cut from everything that has been an idol in your life. Everything that has taken my place. And the truth is, most of us don't know we're cuffed to it. It's just what we think is normal, but it's killing our calling. So through the rest of this series, I need everybody to buckle up. 
I'm just the messenger. I'm getting whooped with this from Tuesday to Sunday. Like this is, God won't let me get up here and preach nothing to you. That he is not taking me through that process in my own life. So today's message hurt me for it hurt you. And I feel like it's going to change you the same way it's changing. And I want to be able to say that because I I need to give pastors and leaders and parents even just a little more leeway to let you know leadership is just being one step ahead of somebody. It's not having it all figured out. It's teaching them what you just learned. And every parent that act like they've been, no, there's no manual when they give your kid and send you home with them. You going to fail at some stuff. And I just want to let you know as a pastor, I'm going to fail at some stuff. If you make me an idol, you're in trouble. I know, I know everybody wants to fan them. But please don't put me in the, I just got to listen to Pastor Mike. No, you need to listen to God. Okay. (laughs) You need to make sure that I'm just a vehicle here today. Could be gone tomorrow. I might go on tour with Fred Hammond. I just uh, I mean, no. If he calls me, I'm out of here. No, I'm just fine. But, but what I'm saying to you is, please be careful to put any man in the spot that only God can occupy. So today, many of us, the truth of the matter is we need to, everybody say, uncuff. And as we're going into the summer, you know, the summer is the dumbest time. It gets hot. We start making r- irrational decisions. I don't know about you, but when I get hot, you just, and, 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 and then there's, there's more skin out, and then there's just, it's just, it's just like, now sweet things that are cold just seem a lot more appetizing. There's just a lot of, when I was in high school, and, and I made a lot of dumb decisions in the, it's because I came out of structure. Uh-oh. Even though I hated getting up for school and I hated going to them classes and I hated having to do all the homework, the structure, the discipline, the consistency kept me out of a lot of stuff I would naturally get into. But when the summer comes, if you didn't have parents that created structure for you, sometimes. Just random, ignorant. How did I start doing that? You knew it because people would change from the last day you saw them at school to the first day, be like, "Uh uh-uh, Geraldo changed. (laughs) Y'all know what I'm talking about? Taniqua different. Susan is (laughs) crazy different. And a lot of times we would be talking about development and all these different things. But the truth of the matter is they had an experience outside of structure that changed who they were. And there are so many people that are in church that have left the spiritual structure. You come to a physical structure, but you don't pray every day. You don't read your word. You substitute spending time with God to listen to your favorite preacher on Instagram. You ain't even listened to the whole sermon. You just took that one minute they clipped up and was like, that's my word for today. That's to entice you. That's an appetizer to go listen to the whole thing so you can have context. Because information or content without context will actually leave you in a catastrophic position. You like them seeds? <sighs> what I'm saying to you is... We have to get back to some level of structure in our spiritual life so so that you have the ability to uncuff from things. And what I found out about structure and this series, God telling me to do the uncuffing, the truth of the matter is, I'm I'm just helping people come in because I got a real word for you today, is this series is all about alignment. Um, It's all about bringing things that are out of order into order. I have a natural example of this. Um, We showed a video today of uh, a a beautiful woman getting a brand new smile um, from a dentist. And that's my dentist. That's Dr. T. Shout out to Dr. T. Uh, This is, 
he's Transformation uh, Church, and it, office is beautiful, and what God is doing through them, it's, it's ministry. He's representing in culture, and, and it's beautiful. Well, when I met Dr. T, you know what I'm saying? The truth of the matter is, like, I thought my teeth was great. <laughs> like, I thought they were so great that when I, when I, when I um, uh, released my first book, um, I put my whole face on the book. Smiling. Can you put a picture of relationship goals on, on the thing? This is my first book. I mean, I am cheesing from ear to ear. And it wasn't until I, I went to see Dr. T that he said, yeah, I saw something on your book. <laughs> Excuse me? Yeah, you saw greatness on the book. You saw the Lord on the book. You saw, no, no, no. He said, no, 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 I saw. And then he pointed this out. Could you go in a little closer real quick? He pointed that one of my teeth had gotten scared of my lips and started <laughs> pushing in. And I never noticed that before. And it wasn't until somebody told me the truth. Okay. I, was, I was so confident in my non-braces that looked like I had braces because two people gave me that compliment when I was in the ninth grade. It looked like you had braces. I said, yeah. <laughs> and for the rest of my life, I'm walking around just yeah, 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 yeah. Not realizing that somewhere around 11, 12th grade, one of them mugs was like, I ain't, I ain't doing this. <laughs> and started pushing back in. <laughs> and I said, so doc, what are we going to do? I, I don't really do good with pain. He said, we're going to bring your teeth into a line. Okay. So what he did was give me Invisalign. He said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a mole of your teeth where they are today. And then every month I'm going to tighten. I'm going to structure. I'm going to put a little pressure on. I'm going to make you a little bit uncomfortable. So that you can align with what? The vision is. So the truth of the matter is, this process worked for me, but there's another process after the process. And this is the process where everybody mess up. Because after your teeth get straight, they say every night, you need to be disciplined to put in what they call a retain. Uh-oh. Which tells me that the level you reach has to not just be maintained, it has to be retained. So I don't care how old you are and how long you've been living this Christian life. God's saying you got to put some discomfort on your spiritual walk so that you can stay in the place that I put you in. Truth, haven't put these in in a week and a half. And anybody that knows what happens when you take a break from being retained, it still fits, but it's very uncomfortable. Oh my God. Mm, mm -mm. Oh God. Mm. What I feel <laughs> that just took one of my thoughts. <laughs> what I feel now compared to what I felt 30 seconds ago is uncomfortable. It's changed my speech. It's, <laughs> it, it, it's changed the way I feel. Like right now, I'm not thinking about y'all. <laughs> it, it's hard to be distracted when you're in a season of restraint. It's hard to be worried about what everybody... The reason I know people be in the comments commenting on everything is because you're unstructured. You're unrestrained. There's nothing keeping you in the place that you're supposed to be. So you comment on everything, but you're not committed to nothing. And what God is saying to some of us right now is, will you let me put the restraint on you? 
Will you let me make you uncomfortable in that relationship? Every time you have an argument, you say sorry first. Clink, clink. <laughs> Restraint. Or the Bible calls it meekness. Hey, when your kids come to you, don't punish them because they embarrassed you. Discipline them. So explain it to them. Then sit with them till they get it. And then do something that takes it away or shows them a different path. But no more punishment. For some of y'all, that'd be the hardest thing in the world because punishment is done out of emotion. And you're mad that they embarrass you in the store because you're actually insecure about being a parent and you don't want nobody to think nothing bad about you, but you're actually causing trauma for your kid that at the end of the day, the only person in that store that they're thinking about is you and how you treated them and how they feel isolated from you. The only person that was sent to protect and cover them, but you're worried about the cashier that don't care nothing about you and you talking about, don't you do that, don't you touch that, don't you... I'm in your business. And the truth of the matter is because you can't exercise any restraint. And God's saying there's some things that we have to come in here and uncuff to. And this is what alignment is. Alignment is when your commitment and your conduct are congruent. So where have you made a commitment that your conduct is not the same? It's not congruent. God is saying to all of us in this room that everything that you have committed to in your heart, it is time to make your actual conduct the same as what you say. And this is going to be rough because some of us lie all the time. Where are you at? Up the street. You haven't left. Come on, let's be. Come on, y'all. Don't. You ready? Almost. You, what? You're, you still have a bonnet on. Somebody just needs to put your hand up if you, if, okay, if there is at least three areas in your life where you need your commitment and your conduct to line up, I need both of your hands in the air right now. Lord, there they are. Okay, Lord. And so, so that's why we have to make a decision as believers to live comfortably uncomfortable. Say that with me. Comfortably get comfortable being uncomfortable stop saying stuff like that ain't ju- that that just ain't me yet well i'm not really good with people yet well i don't know how to handle money yet well i don't like small talk yet like because many times what we've been cuffed to It's keeping us from the next level of what God wants us to do. So I've just made a decision. And as a church, we're making a decision. The reason I'm going to keep preaching this series is because I'm going to make everybody here comfortably. That's who I am. Here is holy. When I wake up every day, there is going to be something that happens that day that makes me uncomfortable. You know when it really flips is when you're not waiting for something uncomfortable to happen to you. But you put yourself in uncomfortable situations. Do you know what type of like energy comes from the heavens when they see one of their child stepping out in something that they they don't naturally do? But they're asking God. Remember what the Bible says that his strength is made perfect in our. Some of y'all haven't seen God's strength because you're not uncomfortable enough to be weak. And so you're believing God to do something he can't help you with because you already strong in that area. You don't need no fresh oil in that area. You know how to do that without him. But to actually step out and do the blog, to actually write the book, to actually go up to your neighbors and witness, you're going to need his strength in your weakness. That's why we got to live comfortably uncomfortable. Okay. And, And I was talking to Bishop who is 71 years old, and he told me to give a message to all the seasoned saints. He said there's a difference between living, not living a stressed life and being comfortable. And I said, explain that to me, Bishop. Give me, give me a little more context. He said most people, especially in their 
um, um, more seasoned years are trying to get to a place where they're comfortable. He said, but at 71, I still have a calling. He said, my calling didn't expire. My calling didn't get old. My calling didn't get crusty. He said, I believe that I've sown enough seeds not to live stressed. But not living stressed is a whole different thing than getting comfortable. He said, Michael, I'll never get comfortable because I'm going to finish and reach my calling. And I started to think that this is what God desires for all of us. And that means that we cannot cater to our comfort. We have to confront it. Everybody say, I will, I will. confront my comfort. comfort. Y'all didn't even say that with any energy because you don't want to lie to yourself. But by faith, I want you to say, I will, I will. Confront, my confront my comfort. One more time, say it with your chest. I will, I will. Confront, my comfort. confront my comfort. You just spoke something into existence that's going to produce the greatest version of you. But now you have to do the work. And that means you cannot cater to your comfort. Because catering to your comfort is not Christian. Luke 9.23, I just got to bring context. And he was saying to all of them, if anyone wishes to follow me, this is Jesus. As my disciple, he must deny himself, set aside selfish interests, and take up his cross daily. Everybody say daily. daily. <laughs> Expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come and follow me, believing in me, conforming to my example in not speech, but in living and if need be, if, if, if the situation calls for it, suffering or perhaps even dying because of faith in me. This is the call God has given us as believers. And that means we have to confront every bit of comfort. So let me ask you a question. When you think of the word cater, what comes to your mind? Food? In, in the chat, what, what comes to some the most service? And, and probably somebody thinks like Jeffrey from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, like he catered to, to that family. Like, but when I looked up the word cater, do you know when we cater to our comfort, what it actually means? The word cater, it means you baby, coddle your comfort, pamper your comfort, gratify your comfort, indulge your comfort, spend money on your comfort, prioritize your comfort, make time for your comfort, provide for your comfort, spoil your comfort, supply your comfort, and listen to this, minister to your comfort. This is the dictionary definition of cater. Minister means you attend to. Some of y'all are doing more ministry to your comfort than you have ever done to a person. But when you confront, it's the flip. When you confront it, you defy your comfort. You encounter your comfort. You meet up, meet, meet me at the yard, comfort. You oppose your comfort. You repel your comfort. You resist comfort. You withstand comfort. You face off. You stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with. You go one-on-one -on -one with. You stand up to. You pull up on. You buck at. Yeah. <laughs> you buck at your comfort. This is the faith attitude you have to have. In this next season. Pastor Mike, why are you going so hard on this? You will not be able to withstand your next blessing. If you don't get the stamina. For many of us, this is a season that God is forming us on the backside of the mountain. And what you're praying for, you're not ready for. So God says, I got to get you to be uncomfortable. Do you know how uncomfortable it is? To know that you're in your purpose and you're going to speak every Sunday and then there will be thousands of people who judge what you say and have the audacity to find, not just click off, not be like, forget them, to take time and write books. Of why, what I said, what I wore, what I did, what if I focused on that piece of what God has given me. It would make me step out of my calling. But I learned a long time ago to be comfortably uncomfortable with people talking about you if you're going to make a difference in anything in life. 
And what I'm saying to you right now, it may not be that same situation, but God is trying to literally fortify you for your actual future. And you are literally repelling it because it's uncomfortable. Some of you, it's going to be uncomfortable to forgive. It's going to be uncomfortable to go to counseling. They don't got to know my whole story. Who does? Who? You didn't tell your mom and them the stuff about them. My mom and my best friend. You didn't, I promise you, you didn't tell them everything. My husband. No, 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 no. Remember the weekend in Miami? It, what I'm saying to you is, it may be uncomfortable to face the truth. And as we're doing this, I need to let you know this. Catering to your comfort is not Christ-like, but confronting your comfort, listen to me, takes courage. Today, I want to encourage you. Because for some of you, you see the messages. Some of y'all didn't even want to click on today. You didn't even want to come to church because it was like, ah. Feel the challenge. Really had a hard week. Really just want to cater to my comfort again. And God's saying, I know it takes courage to do this. I know it takes courage to admit that there are some areas that still need to be worked on. I know you've spent a lot of time trying to make a facade so nobody would see it. And God's saying, I see it. So today, I want to give you courage. I think Joshua 1.9 is fitting for this moment. Have I not commanded you? Receive this. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid of confronting this crap. Do not be afraid of saying I'm sorry. Do not be afraid of telling the truth. Do not be afraid of saying it hurt. I acted like it was fine, but when you left, it actually hurt me. And I've never had a real friend since then because I thought you abandoned me. God said, be encouraged. You don't got to be afraid of that. He said, for the Lord, your God will be with you wherever you go. Today, I want you to know that you can uncuff from things that have kept you from your greatest calling. And God will be with you wherever you go. So let's go to the Bible. Last week, we were talking about David, who in this particular story, um, God was pissed at him when we left off last week. I mean, literally displeased is what the Bible said. Why? It was because in the season where David was supposed to be confronting something, he was catering to his comfort. The Bible said when, when it, the kings usually go to war, he was at the crib chilling. And then he sees Bathsheba and he gets compromised. And when he sees her, he sleeps with her. Though he knew she was married. He goes on the Maury Povich show and finds out that he is the daddy. And, and then he plans the great cover up. And, and he calls the husband Uriah, Bathsheba's husband from the army who was on the front lines answering the call she calls him back this is the MLT remix you can watch last week's sermon so the Michael Living translation so you can get it real quick calls him back and he was trying to make sure that he covered it up so he said go sleep with your wife ain't she fine I know personally and 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 and, and, and he wouldn't because he was committed to his calling he literally sends Uriah back to the front lines, ensuring that he would get killed. And he gets killed. And literally Bathsheba mourns. And after the time of mourning, then David brings her into the house and makes her another side piece, one of his wives. And, and, and this is where the scripture picks up in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 26. When the period of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her to the palace. And she became one of his wives. Then she gave birth to a son. But the Lord was displeased with what David had done. For many of us, for, for myself, this is the spot where most people are going to um, have to have a real decision to confront your comfort. And listen why. Because comfort is not the only thing that comes to cuff us. I found out that comfort has a twin. Anytime you're comfortable, there's a twin that comes with it that I got to talk about today. Okay? Comfort's twin is convenience. So last week we talked of being 
talked about being cuffed to comfort. This week, I got to challenge you because many of us are cuffed to convenience. Anything that is easy is ours. Anything that does not require a lot, that's the choice. Do you want to do it in 10 days or do you want to do it in 10 hours? 10 hours. Why not? What's the... Why, and now we don't even ask what we lose. What would happen if I did it in 10 days? We don't even know. It's just whatever is convenient. Many of us eat our healthy meals from convenience stores. Quick trip every morning. Come and go if you... Wherever your gas station is. We eat fast food because it's killing your body. Praying for a miracle for cholesterol. Asking God to take diabetes from your body. But on the way home from the doctor. I'm going to do one more time. Oh, it's too late to cook. I got to do something convenient. Comfort and convenience is killing your calling. I know, again, this week I amen myself 1,700 times before I got here. I don't need no help. Me and the Holy Spirit standing flat-footed today. Because somebody got to tell you the truth. You've been cuffed to convenience, and it's killing your calling. And God told me to challenge you because being cuffed, to convenience always leads to conception. He was comfortable. He sees Bathsheba. She was convenient. They conceived and had a baby. What is living that was never supposed to be here? Because you brought your comfort and your convenience together and it made something. The truth of the matter is, if you have a calling, don't expect for it to be convenient. There is nothing God has ever called anybody to do that has been convenient. Ask Noah, do you think building an ark when it never rained was a part of his business plan? Well, I just need God to give me the plan. No, you need to obey. It's not going to be. I'm telling you what everybody should have told you. Your plan, if it lines up with God's will, will not be convenient. Does anybody call for prayer? At the time, I ain't got nothing to do. No. Do my kids want to go play at the time I'm ready to play? But being a parent is not about being convenient. Being a pastor, being a leader, being a mom, being a dad, being a human that loves people and will reach out to them will not be convenient. And this Christian idea that walking with God makes everything line up in a calendar. Well, that wasn't a part of God. I'm supposed to be on vacation right now. Well, God, I, 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 I thought I did that when I was younger. You still want me to greet? God, I've passed that. You still want me to serve these young, these millennials? Why would you? He said, I didn't, I ain't ask you. Was this going to be convenient for you? I asked you to obey me. Some of y'all are in careers right now that you are no longer supposed to be in. The only reason you're there is because it's convenient. Well, I got six more years until I retire. God said, I meant for you to make more money than you would ever make in that retirement. But you spending the years you're supposed to be building in a place that I never called you to be. You know why my hand is not there? Because I'm not there. And every time you keep praying for me, I only can provide where there is my purpose. 
you been out here thinking you was helping me because this is convenient. What I'm telling you is comfort is not Christian and convenience is not Christ-like. This is why I got to live comfortably uncomfortable. God will ask you to give away something you want. Ah, golly. He's trying to make you into his image so it will not be convenient when you actually have a calling. So if your life is completely convenient right now, you are out of the calling God has for your life. All right, I'm going to prove it to you. <laughs> Second Samuel chapter 12, we're going to go to the Bible because some of y'all looking real mad right now. So the Lord sent Nathan, the prophet, to tell David this story. Listen to this. There were two men. This is after he did all this just grimy stuff to Uriah and, 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 and was very, very ratchet. Um, he says, so the Lord sent Nathan, the prophet, to tell David this story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich, one was poor. The rich man owned a great many of sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate, plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day, a guest arrived at the home of the rich man. But instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb, the only one he had, and he killed it and prepared it for his guests. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing as this deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one lamb he stole. For having no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are that man. I'm Nathan today. And I came to tell you the very thing you would be outraged at if it happened in somebody else's life. If you saw your friend or your cousin or somebody and you would get outraged and I can't believe they would ever say that. And I can't believe they would ever do that. Yep. You are that man. You are that woman. There are two truths that I want to pull out of this to help us all because it wrecked me all week. The first point, write it down. The truth is uncomfortable. <laughs> Nathan told David the truth for the first time. Dr. T told me the truth for the first time. And I was almost offended at what had the opportunity to change my life. There is a thin line between offense and opportunity. And many times we always talk about my haters, these haters, these haters. I hate people talking about the haters because sometimes the haters are actually for you. The people you are labeling haters are the only people with the courage to tell you the truth. You're getting arrogant. How do these haters come? No, you get, you, there's a stench of pride on everything you're saying right now. But you won't hear it because they the hater. They ain't got what I got. If they was in the Gucci and the Louie and the Bowie and the Dewey, then and, and you start making all of these barriers for people to tell you the truth. How many barriers have you put up to the truth? How many, how many years do people have to serve? To actually tell you something and you receive it. Some of us are so prideful that God would have to send a Nathan to tell you and give you a story to make you outraged about it happen to somebody else and then flip it on you and say, that's you. How you ain't see that you've been gossiping this whole time, but you hate them for gossiping? <laughs> You do it your family. They do it on Instagram. It's the same thing. Yeah. How are you mad at them for not coming into work because you they supervisor, but you take an hour and a half break when it's supposed to be 45 minutes. How? how? It's incongruent. And, and what has happened in this is that the truth has now become so offensive that people will not even entertain the thought of it maybe 
being able to impact their life. This especially works for people who have had kids and their kids are out the house. Some of my older saints, y'all are stubborn. I got to say it because people have been trying to tell you things and your response is I'm grown. That don't mean you ain't dumb. <laughs> You're in debt up to your eyeballs. You've been dumb with money. And now somebody tells you something else and your response to potentially the truth is I'm grown. That don't look good on you. What you talking about? I fit it, huh? Look at all of this. You, you, okay. And we try to poke a hole in people's honesty many times be, and, and, and classify it as opinion. Well, that's your opinion. That's your opinion. So everybody got a, opinions is like, I can't even say what it's like. Um, but everybody got one. Y'all, some of y'all been raised. How I, okay, okay. But the thing that I've started doing over the past five years, I want to encourage you to do. Whenever you hear something that is offensive, extract the truth and leave the hurt. No, hear me. Hear me. Extract the truth. Is there? Holy Spirit. I'm about to roll off and sock this person in their mouth. But before I do, is there any truth? Is there anything I've been blinded to? Is there anything you've been trying to show me? Is there anything you've been trying to agitate out of my anointing? Is there anything you've been trying to put friction on to smooth it? Is there any truth to what you're saying right now? And what I need to tell you is the truth is never comfortable, but the truth can uncuff you. <laughs> That's why the Bible says, in John 8, 32, then you will know the truth and the truth will do what? It'll set you free. It'll uncuff you. And I heard it interpreted this way. Then you will know the truth and the truth, you know, will set you. It's not enough to hear the truth. You have to know it's the truth. And too many of you hear truth and will not even evaluate it long enough to see if it is the truth. David had to send, um, God had to send Nathan to speak to David and tell him the truth. And that's why we have the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit's job, if you read the Bible, is to lead and guide us into all truth. That's how I know people don't speak to the Holy Spirit. Because the truth of the matter is, you don't even see you. You are. <laughs> Let me just say it like this. You are so aware and not self-aware. How are you so aware of everything? David was so passionate about this story that was made up that he said that man should die and have to repay with four lambs and couldn't even see. This is a story about you. Why? Because comfort always clouds your convictions. When you're comfortable, your convictions are cloudy. You don't know what you believe. You don't know when to pull it out. Do I believe in cussing people out? Or do I believe in turning the other cheek? And when you're comfortable, your convictions get you. You're the youth minister of the year. But somebody step on your shoes? What the? Oh, y'all all got things. Y'all better not sit up here and act like I'm the only one. During your birthday weekend, you turn up every year. Why? Because it's comfortable. And you have not learned how to reconcile the disappointment of where you are in your life. <laughs> I'm going to just say it. You've not learned to reconcile the disappointment you've had in your life and where you actually are and you kind of mad at God. So every time around the same uh, area of your life, you started a cycle. 
getting drunk, hooking up with people, going places you know you're not supposed to go. It's incongruent with who you're trying to be all the rest of the year. But it's a place of, everybody say comfort. Can I talk to some parents? Your kids are grown. They need coaches. Not parole officers. If you raised me, it's, the Bible says raise a child in the way they should go. But you got to give me an opportunity to pick myself. And so if you actually raise me, now you got to give me opportunity to do what you've raised me to do. And there are so many parents that are supposed to be right next to people in the seasons of their life. What a privilege it is to be somebody who has both parents, a parent, a parent-like person in their life to walk with you through situations. But the truth of the matter is even when you're there, most of them will not come to you because you have not understood how to separate the conviction you had when they were 12 and the conviction you have when they're 32. I'm trying to really help some people. Well, our, our connection is not close anymore because you're mean to them and you treat them like they're not an adult. They pay bills. <laughs> Let me... Uh, God, this is the, the, the burden of pastoring a multi-generational church. I, I, I feel both sides. And God's saying... I gave you a new conviction, not to boss them around, but to pray for them daily. And because you are comfortable being the parent, I know he ain't going to come up here and bring that little girl over here and that's the guy and she's not in my house. Not in my house. Why every Thanksgiving and every Christmas you acting up? I'm in some, like there are some of y'all who starts this drive right now because this is your real situation. You have wisdom to pass to the next generation. The Bible said the older should give and impart into the younger. But your comfort of being the boss has now created separation. And it might be uncomfortable for somebody to eat different food at the holidays. You're not making the mac and cheese this year. I, I want to come down to because you will be offended and mess up the whole day. And they won't see you again until Mother's Day. Because you acted a fool because you're comfortable being the boss. I'm, I don't care what's that. It's in my house. He can get out. He's been out. But now you're pushing him out. And the woman he marries actually needs your wisdom. Okay, I got to get out of here because I'm being too real today. And the saint, like, the, David, David in this moment where his, his vision is cloudy because he was comfortable. He had passion about the wrong thing. And there's nothing worse than being passionate with poor perspective. You ever met somebody who was passionate about the wrong thing? Like, that ain't never going to help you in life. Like, why are you so passionate about Pokemon cards? Like, what? And I'm just using that as an example that just came to my head. But everybody passionate about stuff. And it's like, if you could just take that passion and just, oh, make sure it's aligned with your purpose. That's how you get to the place. And David had passion. And it's so funny. It just reminds me of people that have all the facts, but it's about something that's futile or they have strong opinions, but they've never been through that same obstacle or they can call out people, but they've never had to care for people. David couldn't see himself. And my question to you that I had to ask myself because I've been cuffed to convenience is has your convenience clouded your ability to see you. Everything set up around how you want it, when you want it, where you want it, how it feels good. I don't do that because I don't have to. Okay. But do you do it because you need to? Like these are the questions that the Holy Spirit has been literally saying, get up in the morning, Michael. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What you doing today? 
Like, this is how my spiritual life, what God has been over this past. He was like, good morning, grace and mercy, new every morning. You ready? Okay. And don't eat that. Like, it's like, oh, my gosh. He said, you're in training, though. He said, Mike, I told you here is holy. He said, 2023, you will be prepared for the blessings, the callings, the platforms, and the transformation I'm going to do. It's, but you never prepare on a platform. You never get on the platform and prepare. It's always done in the dark. And some of y'all, because you want to be comfortable right now, you know you're in a season of hiding. You know God has not blown it up to where it's going to be. You know he's somehow keeping the cap on the thing just to make sure you have enough time to develop what it is in you so that you don't turn back. And you still choosing comfort? Instead of your calling, this is what David did. First Samuel chapter 12, verse 7, y'all, this is so good to me. It says, the Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you the freaking king of Israel. And I saved you from the power of Saul. You remember you was ducking Saul all them years? I saved you. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdoms. This sounds like I saved you from that broken home. I brought you into a different mind state. I surrounded you. I let you graduate college. I let you get into that neighborhood. I provided those vehicles. I brought you into this community. Like, this is what he's telling me. He's like, remember. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Oh, it is a sad day when God said, now I'm about to hold back from you because you committed to comfort. What if the greatest thing that God wanted to do was not held up because you weren't qualified? It was held up because you were committed to comfort. Like, it's not even that you got to know how to do it. I'll, I'll supply you. God is good at supplying every one of the needs. Like, you can't talk, I'll bring your brother Aaron. I, you ain't got no wood, I'll make it come out of nowhere. You, like, that's what God does. But if you're going to sit back in comfort, he said, I had so, so much more for you. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? Why did you cater to your comfort? And I begin to really get stuck there and ask why. Everybody say why. why? Have you ever asked yourself why you do certain stuff? The truth of the matter is most of us don't ask ourselves that. We ask other people, like, why would, why would Will just go in? Skabow. Chris. <laughs> and all the conversations are speculation of why. And I've had more conversation. I'm just using that example because everybody knows that. Like, I'm using that as an example because everybody's trying to figure out. But you haven't asked yourself, why do you keep getting in relationships like that? You've never asked yourself, why? Do you always shrink back when God's already put it in you? You've never asked yourself why you keep claiming to be shy and you not shy. We just end up rolling with what's comfortable. Lord, help me help your people. The truth of the matter is the question why is a gateway to transformation. When I went on this journey of losing weight, the thing that sparked it, I've tried so many times. If I'm honest, I've tried so many. Today, I'm not eating at all, just water. <laughs> y'all know, y'all know, I don't know if there's any people that go to the extreme. It's like, like if you, the day before you was eating full cakes and burgers and pizza, and then the next day it's like nothing but air for me. <gasps> that was yummy. Like, it was like, what? I've tried. Do you know what flipped the switch for me, Dad? As I asked myself, why? Why don't I ever complete what I started? It wasn't even about the workout. It was deeper than that. And when I start to think about the why of why David did this, it was convenience. But the thing that was deeper than that, Amberly, 
The core of it, that's what I'm asking you to find. Nothing changes on the topsoil. If you have a tree or a weed that's growing, if you just pull it out, you ain't do nothing. Because it still has all of the ingredients to grow. This is why you're cuffed to it, because it's in the core. And if we're going to pull out the core of why we are cuffed to convenience, the only thing that I saw in this entire story over and over, he was cuffed, and the reason he did it was because of selfishness. Convenience is fueled by selfishness. Comfort is fueled by self. If everything you do is about comfort and convenience, you are selfish. Hi, my name is Nathan, and I just came to tell you, you're selfish. If you never do anything that makes you late, that makes you not have it how you want to have it, that makes you have to sacrifice, if you only do what's comfortable and convenient, you're selfish. And there are so many spiritually selfish people. And you're watching now. Hi. The truth is you could be up at a church serving right now. But you chose, well, Pastor Mike is the only one to give me the word. He's the only one that, you know what I'm saying? And, and most pastors would never say this because they want you to tune in. I want you to transform. The, the, the truth of the matter is you can watch this all week. We post this every Sunday at 5. You can have the same experience and make it your church time at 5 p.m. every Sunday. But the reason you're not at that church right up the street from your, church, from your house is because you're selfish. They need you in the children's ministry. They need you at the front. There's a pastor right now praying for somebody with your skill set. And the only reason that you're sitting here is because of comfort and com you're in your pajamas right now eating your favorite bowl of cereal you didn't want to do your hair you did not want to get out you did it for the world all week but you won't do it for God's people and this is what I'm telling you right now if you are committed to comfort and convenience you're selfish ding ding round three here we go Catering to your comfort is centered around selfishness. You don't need to get paid for everything God's placed in your hand. No, 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 uh -uh, no, 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 no. I got Bible for this, Pastor Mike. Bring the camera right here. Come on, right here. Because I got to talk to him. I got to. The Bible says a workman is worthy of his hire. They need to hire me and pay me. The Bible also says, whatever your hands find to do, yes. do it with all your might as unto. How many times does God have to place something in front of you that you won't do unless the paper is right? There are things you were supposed to pay for out of your pocket that would have given you the connection for your next thing and purpose. But God could not even trust you with the simple task of using what he gave you because you're selfish and you are committed to comfort and convenience. And so now God has to literally allow tragedies to happen to get your attention instead of him speaking to you and you obeying. Because if it ain't about the paper, y'all better stop listening to all these rappers and all these people out here. It's about the coin. No, it's about my calling. And if God has told me to do something and if he's given me a burden for it and if they don't have the money to pay me for it, I will obey what God has called me to do because I am committed to my calling over comfort. Somebody say calling over comfort. <laughs> but many of us want, want it to be convenient. David saw Bathsheba and could have had any other single woman in the kingdom. But the reason he took Bathsheba, it was he was in a comfortable place. And he saw something that was convenient. Go get her. Don't go look for all of the beautiful women in the kingdom. That would take too much work. I already seen what I want. She married, don't matter. She got standards, don't matter. This would ruin my character. I'm the king. I've earned this. 
I'm comfortable. So get me what's convenient. And we're going to conceive something. And we're going to act like God's going to be pleased with us living comfortable and convenient. And we're going to post our Bible scriptures. But we're not going to be an active member of any community or church. We're going to hop from place to place. We're going to do only things with our family that cater to us. Thanksgiving ain't about nobody else. You ain't bought a Thanksgiving meal for nobody ever. Well, we invite some people over. You got that big old house to entertain nobody. You prayed that God would bless you with that house for what? So you could take one picture with a key in front of your house with your realtor? And then nobody ever come there? I got the keys, the keys, the keys. You need people. But that would be inconvenient to clean up after them. You got work in the morning. Oh. <laughs> you know that kid needs a ride home from school every day. And you see him standing there with your kid. And you won't give him a ride because you got things to do. Their parent can't even be there for them because of unforeseen circumstances. But God sent you because you have just the right nature and just the right nurture. You could be, you don't know who that little kid is and who they're going to be and where the platform is. And God sent you into their life. And yes, when you stop and get your kids Chick-fil-A, you're going to have to pay every day $7 for day Chick-fil-A too. And you better not complain about it because I gave you a raise at your job and I blessed you so that you could be a black. But you won't even, you won't even be my hands and feet on the earth. Because you're committed to comfort and convenience. Being comfortable is usually convenient, y'all. Yeah, this is easy. And I want to challenge you today. Don't do what's convenient. Do what's a part of your calling. In our culture, we want everything convenient. We want a microwave miracle, but we serve a crockpot God. God, God cool with taking his time. You good? All right. I'll be back in the next three years. Just keep doing what I told you to do. And we sing, we singing, I'm expecting a miracle. I'm expecting a miracle. It's a fresh miracle. Ain't no fresh miracle coming. <laughs> Obedience. Yeah. Yeah. Stay right there. No, no, no. Your friends upgrade. People you don't know, but you see them on Instagram, married. Be obedient. Where are you, God? I feel like I'm in the desert. I'm lost without you. Where are you? And God said, I'm, I'm right here. I just asked you to do, remember like, it's seed. Uh-oh, some of y'all. Some of y'all remember the message. It's, help me, see. So, time. We don't know how long the time is. And there are too many people because you are cuffed to convenience and comfort, you don't like the time. You sing, I'm going to wait on you. But in the meantime, I'm going to do what I do. Some of y'all got relationships. You should have never met the person. <laughs> You're healing from hurts that you were never supposed to experience. It's why? Because it was in the time. <laughs> and we don't serve a microwave God. We serve a crock pot. Okay, what's your favorite food holiday? Yell it out at me. Put it in the chat. What's your favorite holiday to eat? Help me. Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter. Easter? What y'all do at Easter? I ain't never heard that one. Usually Thanksgiving, Christmas, those are the big. Okay, all my Christmas eaters, you like Christmas, hands in the air, hands in the chat. All my Thanksgiving eaters, come on, hand, dang, Thanksgiving. Okay, cool. What is the centerpiece of your Thanksgiving? 
the turkey. For some people, it's chicken. Some people, it's ham. Some people, y'all got worthy. But around the world, it's, it's a turkey. Now, it's crazy. In my household, we only got turkey two times a year. It wasn't like, unless it was like sliced turkey or something like for a sandwich, wasn't nobody cooking a turkey on a Thursday. That just wasn't happening at my house. But we knew at Thanksgiving and at Christmas, whether it was nasty or not, there was going to be a turkey on the thing. But what I could expect every other day of the week is a food when I got home from school that was convenient. Can I show you what I grew up on? This right here. My mama like, what is that? Something you didn't cook? This was a hot pocket. Look at her. She tripping on the front row. This? Where my brother's at? Do y'all remember eating these hot pockets? Thank you. Mama trying to be like, that is not the truth. Yes, it is. Hi, my name is Nathan, Mom. We ate Hot Pockets. Okay. This right here with some ranch dressing. And the best part about a Hot Pocket is at the moment you got hungry, could pull it out the package, hit that microwave, put it on one minute, see there's nothing like this little timer right here, cause this little timer right here gives me an expectation. And most believers want this little timer. When am I getting married? When is it change? Okay, 34 more seconds? Okay. Okay, when I, when I turn 30? Yeah, yeah, I'm just going to, I'm going to just stay here. No, 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 no. I'm going to just stay here and wait a, a, until what God promised me is done. God has no visible timer. So what God does will never be as convenient as a Hot Pocket. He's holy. He's sovereign. And he wants you. End? Does that mean what I put in is ready? I prayed, God. I fasted. I gave him a crazy faith offer. So it should be ready by now. And we want to... Pop this thing open. I'm taking my line out. Oh, to eat this, I have to take out alignment. <laughs> I have not eaten a hot pocket. It's probably been 20 years. Don't do it. What are you talking about? This thing is hot and I'm hungry. Oh. This is convenient. I am hungry. I've worked out today. I deserve something to eat. But it would take me 15 to 20 more minutes to wait to get what's in the back prepared for me. Or to eat what is currently convenient. And most of us, because we are committed to comfort, it's nostalgic. I remember this. So many good days. Of watching Hey Arnold. <laughs> y'all, y'all, I would watch Hey Arnold, put a bunch of Hidden Valley on this mug, give me a Shasta. Y'all remember Shastas? The fruit punch. Ain't nothing like a cold fruit punch Shasta. That was like alcohol to me. I go. Oh my God. It's still good. (laughs) Let me help you understand something. It being convenient doesn't mean it's not good. Having sex, I don't care who is with. 
God meant for that to feel good. Y'all see how quiet it just got right here? Like, <laughs> doing things in secret and getting away with it to our flesh, it feels good. How do you know? You could do the same thing with a person who wants to do it and it don't feel the same. The person you're in covenant with and it don't feel the same. You get a better high out of sneaking and telling them you're going to the, to give your friend $20 of gas money because the wrong got stuck on the side of the, the, the street in, in, in Bixby. And sneaking over the old girl or old boy's house and making it, there's something. Oh, you're cuffed to the climax. Yeah, I'm gonna do that series too. Cause you're chasing a high that God never promises you because it's not holy and you're trying to feed something that will never be satisfied. I, I don't want to get up here and preach to you that the things that your flesh like don't feel good. They're just not good. Okay. Who Come close. What is this? Have you ever opened up a hot pocket? What? They said pepperoni on the thing, but actually, like, what is the mush? What is the thing? Like, what am I actually? I don't even ask, and I don't even care what's nourishing me because it is, everybody say it with me, convenient. But do you know what would make me very upset is to come to Thanksgiving Y'all know what would piss me off? You know, because sometimes you got to prepare for Thanksgiving. Like, you don't eat certain things the day before. Preparing. There's two things that would make me mad. It's if I came to the Thanksgiving dinner at the Todd household, and there was no turkey, no dressing, no mac and cheese. It was just a stack of Hot Pockets. I would be livid. But you know the other thing that would make me mad? It's if somebody tried to cook the turkey. <laughs> tried to take something that's supposed to be in the oven <sighs> for a certain amount of time. And they decided, let's do what's convenient. And they put the turkey. That don't even... How long do you cook a turkey in the microwave? No, for real. Put it in the chat. I need y'all help. How long do you cook a turkey in the microwave? Three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. That's what I heard from the crowd. So when I hear things from the crowd that I didn't hear from the manufacturer, which one am I going to listen to? Somebody said three minutes. Cook the turkey for three minutes. Seven to nine minutes? Put the time or what? Down? I don't, I've already committed to three minutes. And they're more popular than you. And they have more followers than you. <laughs> and I actually like their aesthetic and how they look and how they worship and where they live and where they take vacation. So I'm going to listen to people who are not qualified. Because it's comfortable. And convenient. Well, I can't wait. I can't wait to see what type of salmonella is on this piece of. <laughs> Woo, look at it. And I put my own timer up here. Oh, you see what happened? I set the time. So many times, Convenience is what we choose because we set the time. <laughs> so God says something and we say that's uncomfortable and not convenient. I'll do this thing that looks like it's actually working. 
and I'll set the time, and I'll just wait and act like everything's good and act like God's blessing and sing Fred Hammond, bless, bless, bless. And God's saying, why have you committed to convenience when it tastes so much better? When what you would experience would be completely different if you would just commit to doing what is. Everybody say uncomfortable. uncomfortable. Yep. Convenience is usually a counterfeit, y'all. Anything that's convenient usually ends up in a counterfeit. Catering to what's convenient, write it down in a point, always has consequences. My microwave turkey now needs to feed people. No matter if it's done or not, this was intended to nourish people. So it's going to be consumed by others no matter how I prepare it. Your kids didn't pick you. If they could have, they would have sent you back. If you live your life in convenience, uh-oh, the Turk Turk's done. <laughs> Let me get the presentation together. Yes. Anybody got a knife? I need to carve this. Look at that. And this is what we present to God. Ready to preach to the nations. Character undercooked. I can still see you. It's smoking hot. They're popular. They got, they, they got views. But still bleeding on the inside. I know I'm called. Yeah, the potential is here. But you're still underdeveloped because you were committed to comfort and convenience and God is challenging me to tell you today that this is unacceptable now knowing what he's placed on the inside of you if you want to stay cuffed to this this is what you want your marriage to look like see the truth of the matter is listen to me listen to me listen to me this has a calling to feed but underdeveloped, it will make the very people they are called to feed sick. And it would be better for some of y'all to stay frozen than to come out full of convenience and comfort. Anybody want a bite? I'll pay somebody a hundred dollars so, 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 so this is the truth of the matter the truth of the matter is right now what is supposed to be appetizing is repelling because it was committed to convenience and comfort can you bring me the done turkey yeah, I don't even, just keep the play. I don't even need to play. Been hungry. <laughs> Who made this? This? Brent, come here. Where Brent? Is he in here? Scotty, come here. Bella, come here. Come here, Bells, come on. My baby, she likes to eat with me. Taste this. Tell me if it's good. Just bite it. Bite it like a little monkey. That's good, huh? Brent, come taste this. Come taste that. That's the bomb, ain't it? Daddy, come taste this. <laughs> Y'all, today my daddy's uh, 67th birthday. This is your birthday present. <laughs> that's, that's the... Hold, now, well, <laughs> that example's over. Uh, no, it's good. Uh, 
That turkey for real, no cap, is the bomb. It was prepared by a master griller. It was prepared somebody who knew just the right temperature to keep it at and what seasonings needed to go in it and what the rub was, <laughs> the friction that had to be put on it. It had somebody that knew exactly, watch this, the fire it had to be in. It had to be put in heat. Some of you, what you are going through is necessary for you to be fully developed in the calling. God, stop praying away what God has given to make you. Sometimes it's the fire that develops the flavor. Boy, I'm preaching up here. I don't care what none of y'all say. I, this is finger licking good. Hear what I'm saying to you. We would have never experienced the flavor. Doesn't the Bible say taste and see? People are tasting you and you nasty. It's because you were committed to comfort and what else? Convenience. And when you're committed to that, listen, I got to end. Catering to what's convenient always has consequences. Listen to the consequences after David makes this move. First Samuel chapter 12, verse 10. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me. Not even Uriah or Bathsheba by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. Y'all know Absalom and all his children taking his throne. It didn't have to happen. Absalom was born into a cycle that had God's protection off of it. He didn't have any restraint, so he came after his daddy's throne. It's not because of what Absalom did. It was David's fault he was on the run. Everybody be preaching about the Absalom spirit, the Absalom spirit. It was his daddy who let it in. And some of the stuff that you see in your kids and you acting, where did that come from? And how did that happen? And I ain't never been. You let it in, not by your commission, but by your omission. You can disobey God by doing something and disobey God by not doing something. Some of y'all should be in church serving, helping your community, but you're comfortable and convenient. And he said, this is going to affect your kids because they were supposed to see service at a different level. They were supposed to learn what it meant to give and sacrifice and do that. And Absalom was born into the result of his daddy making this mistake. It was his consequence. He said, your, house, your own household will rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes. Now, what, God? That is really... Now, hold on now. And, and let me, let me help, help you some more. And he will go to bed with them in public view. I'm going to make what you did in private. <laughs> Y'all, this is the Bible. I'm not saying this. Y'all seeing this? I'm going to make what you did in private to them happen to you in public. <laughs> this is real life, Luke 638. Give, and it shall be given back to you. Good measures. Nobody want to preach it like this. Shaken together and pre pressed down, shaken together and running over. Verse 13, then David confessed to Nathan, you know what? I've sinned against the Lord. Really been doing some self-evaluation. Um, Nathan said, duh. But this is the grace of God before Jesus. You got to see it in the, in the Old Testament. There are types and shadows of what Jesus would become for all of us. Thank God that God ain't putting decrees out like this because of the blood of the lamb and Jesus being there as our advocate. Some of y'all need to take two minutes and thank God for grace because some of y'all would have stuff taken away from you in public. 
y'all not even excited about what God has done through Jesus. This is why we celebrate. This is why we worship. It's because our actions and our consequences do not match because of Jesus. But even in the Old Testament, he's showing a type and a shadow of Jesus. He said, I'm going to let these consequences happen to you. But the Lord has forgiven you. What? So, so, so my forgiveness and my consequences don't cancel each other out? No. This is why it's better to live uncomfortable and do the things beforehand to stay in alignment. Because God can forgive you and you still have to go through the consequences. <clears throat> go sleep with somebody else outside of your marriage bed. It's okay. You can go and still go to heaven if you repent and ask God for forgiveness. But you won't probably be going back to that house. <laughs> it, 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 and, and many times we think God is not good because our consequences are not good. And I got to help your theology right there. The fact that you're still alive and you're not dead because of your sin. <laughs> like, when you did that, that's one of the big ten. That's one of the ten commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Like, that's one of them. <laughs> so when you do that one, he said, I'm not going to kill you. I just need you to go back to Jesus. But it's going to be a lot of work, a lot of truth, a lot of trust building to go back to that family. And a lot of people give up when you should fight for your family, man of God. You made a mistake, but that's not who you are. That's what you settled for when you were comfortable and committed to convenience. You need to fight for it. But the reason you're not fight, fighting for it is because you're not conditioned to be uncomfortable. So when you walk in the house and she don't give you a kiss because all she saw is all the time she walked in the house before and it seemed normal. But stuff was happening in the background. And now you're trying, now you're really trying to do it. And she's like, get off me. You ain't going to disrespect me in my house. You disrespected her. Come on, come on. And she's trying to heal from a wound that you won't even go to counseling with her to talk about. Am I being too real right now? At the end of the day, you will not be in a comfortable position probably for the next decade, if you fully commit to fighting for the family that you know God gave you. You know that's the wife that makes you better. You know those children's world will be shattered if you walk out of this situation. And God's begging you to commit to being comfortably uncomfortable. And all you can do is talk about how you a grown man. And I can go out and get whatever I want to. You're about to destroy your calling over over literally pride or what's the word selfishness this is why all through the scripture all God is telling you to do die to your flesh kill yourself as ambition stab all of the things that you want that don't benefit nobody else that's all he's telling us through the word why because if you're not cuffed to convenience and comfortability you will be one that reaches their calling the comfort zone is where culture tells you to get to. But the comfort zone is where callings go to die. If you're trying to get to the comfort zone, say bye-bye to your calling. Could you put the comfort zone up there? Because some of us are so cuffed to convenience. We just, we just wanna, we want people to see it. Yeah, this is where we want to live. It's comfortable here. I can be seen here. And God says, now go after the things that I've put in front of you. Living a blessed life, being generous. Just reach out and touch it. And with all my might, I cannot reach it while still standing. In the comfort zone. I really want to live a blessed life, but I got to tithe and honor God. And that's outside of my comfort zone. I really 
want to give to people, but I don't have enough. But you could start with $10 a week that you spend on Starbucks. Really for the picture, you don't even like it. <laughs> but you're committed to the comments and cuffed to it. Maybe I'll do a series on that. And God said, I need a church that will start stepping out of their comfort and convenience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One step, one step in the next direction. Oh, I want to be spiritually healthy. I, I, I want to be physically healthy. You cannot reach either one of those as much as I stretch. I'm going to end up falling, trying to maintain my position in comfort and go after the thing. God's saying, just step out. Step out of what you've been in. Just get uncomfortable. Like, I want to be spiritually healthy. Put it back on these screens right here. I want to be spiritually healthy. Step out into it. And then walk over here and get physically healthy. And then it makes you want to walk back over here, step over the comfort, and get, and, and get spiritually healthy. And then it makes me want to step over the comfort and go back and get physically healthy. See, what happens is you are now turning a discipline into a desire. Everybody wants to desire it. It never starts out as a desire. It starts out as a discipline. It's why I get up in the morning and I go work out. And then I go and I read my word. And I pray and I worship. And then I go back and I do my meal prep. And I walk and I, I'm recording my step. And God's saying what now you've committed to is going to be something you desire. And now what was, used to be a dread, frustrating, hurtful, becomes something that you know is making you better. I'm better uncomfortable. But that means I got to divorce the comfort zone. Put them last ones up there. This is a big one. <laughs> I want to be an active father. And I want to be an empathetic mother. That would cause me to have to get out of my comfort zone of how I was raised. I beat kids because I got beat. But, well, I, my kids know I'm there. They got all the, they got the latest J's. They got the latest thing. They got, I got to work because I got to give them da, 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 da. And God said, would you step out of your comfort zone? Would you make $10,000 less a year to have a lasting relationship with your children? But that means you would have to step out of your comfort zone. So you got to wear the J's all year, Junior. He going to be fine because you're there. And then you get to tell them stuff like, them ain't old. They vintage. <laughs> like, she, you, get to, you, you get to coach him up. You get to, but that means you got to step out of your comfort zone. And you, your daughters need you. They need you, but you still have this hard exterior because of how you had to protect yourself against your baby daddy. And now, you, every time you see them, you see him. And because you've not dealt with all the trauma he took you through, you are now using that as an excuse. To create so much and you're not, you, there's no empathy for your children. And all God's saying is, tell them I experienced that too. Tell them mommy wasn't always what you know mommy as. Tell them a real story. Oh, hold on. These little sanitized, you know, we've all made mistakes. No. Tell them. What you did on that campus and how it made you feel afterwards and how God redeemed you. Stop sanitizing what God saved you from. L listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. They're going to find out anyway. Everything my parents tried to shield me from, I found out. And usually by the wrong person. 
not a pastor, not somebody who was thinking from a godly perspective. I found out from somebody who was trying to pervert my thinking. And what I'm saying for everybody, could you step out of your, everybody say comfort zone. Last one. I I forgot there was one more. (laughs) Fulfilling purpose and making a difference only can be reached outside of your comfort zone. You will never make a difference in this world in your comfort zone. And you will never be able to fulfill your purpose standing right here. So today, I'm asking you to step out of the dark and to come in to a brand new level of light. And I want you to confront comfort and convenience. Some of y'all have been cuffed to convenience. And now I'm going to give you very practical ways that God uses to confront it. Write them down and we're going home. Number one, community. You need a Nathan. If you don't have a Nathan in your life to tell you the truth, you are going to be in serious trouble when it comes to reaching your calling. Ecclesiastes 4 9, two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. The second thing God uses, he uses community. The second thing he uses to help you confront your comfort and your convenience is he uses, watch this, you concentrating on your calling. When you start concentrating on your calling more, it makes you not think about your convenience and your comfort as much. David, if he would have kept his calling in front of him, if he would have went out to war, this would have never been a situation for him. But that's why it makes me think of Nehemiah when he was building the wall and all of these distractions tried to come and get him. He said, please don't bother me right now. The work that I'm doing is too great. The calling that I have is too great to come down. And some of you, the greatest discipline you can have is a calling from God that is a distraction. You don't need something new. You need to be distracted by what you're supposed to do. And God uses your calling to keep you there. Concentrating on your calling keeps you from compromise. Oh, my God. Number three. You need to commit in covenant. God uses covenant, especially the covenant of marriage. He uses the covenant. Everybody, the, the little boy laughing is my son. I want him in the presence of God. Don't let it bother you. I, so, so when I preach and if you hear a little boy laughing or anything, I, I want my son in the presence of God. I don't know what's going to happen in these environments. And so I just want everybody to know if you're getting distracted by that, get distracted by your calling <laughs> right now. I'm just trying to walk this thing out live in front of you, okay? So so one of the things that's going to help you is to commit in covenant. Marriage is one of God's greatest tools to rob you of comfort and convenience. When you get married, it's a stick up. They should do the wedding vows like this. Are you ready to say your vows? (laughs) And they should point, somebody should be like, for better or for worse. Dude, like that's what it should be like because the truth of the matter is do not get married if you're not ready to die I heard somebody say it like this I think it was Levi Lusco I saw it it was so good he said how do you know it's the right person that you're supposed to marry he said you choose somebody that you're willing to suffer with because that's what marriage is you can't hide nothing you can lie to your coworkers and say you brush your teeth. She saw you. <laughs> you can. <laughs> Why am I saying this to you? Because God uses that container of marriage to work out self. Do you know how many times I got to go turn out lights and turn up the thermostat and turn down the daggum thermostat? Get a remote. You just walk past the very thing. You about to ask me to get, I was in the bed. But you forgot to set the alarm. But I'm the man. But you're the woman. 
Like I, <laughs> some of y'all who ain't married, y'all know what I'm talking about yet. But I need to tell you, when you get married, that core of selfishness, God works it out of you through the covenant of marriage. So for all my married people who are uncomfortable, it's working. I thought by now we 15 years in, it should be easier. No, it's different. <laughs> you aren't married to who you were married to 15 years ago. But you stopped being committed to the calling of serving and protecting and loving no matter what through the body changes, through, through the hormone changes. through you, you, you weren't committed to loving him through a midlife crisis and when he got laid off and when the, and when the investment went down and, and, and how it struck on his manhood. You, 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 if you're uncomfortable, it's working. And God's saying, all right, now bring that to me because I'm going to sacrifice your comfort. And your convenience. And let me tell you the next thing that God uses. Oh, this one good right here. <laughs> he, he lets those people in covenant cultivate kids. <laughs> Cultivating kids is one of God's most precious tools to kill selfishness. Oh, y'all know you. Cultivating your kids is the most thankless, unappreciated, day and night. Have your kids ever gotten sick on the day that you were supposed to rest? Have you ever had to get up? In the middle of the night to clean up, throw up, poop, pee. Some of y'all nasty. You just leave your kids. You just put the towel down. I know y'all. Y'all just put the towel down. And <laughs> Nobody wants to get exposed. But I know. Kids aren't convenient. But they're a cut to your selfishness. It's not until you really embrace raising and nurturing a child that you understand the love of God when I started when I became a father eight years ago it changed my revelation of God there's no way how attentive me and my wife are to the cries and the moans of our children that that did not come from a father who's listening and bottling every tear. You bottling hair because they had curls. God is picking up every one of your tears. Do y'all hear what I'm saying to you? So, so there needs to be a recommitment for many of us to parenting. Parenting. Because if you would commit to being fully unselfish in that area, it would change how you see Comfort and convenience. I'm gonna give you two more and we're gonna go home. Or I'll just give you one more. Your connection to Christ is the greatest tool that God uses for you to confront your comfort. When you connect to Christ, He literally says, I love you. I believe in you. I'm gonna use you. Ready to die? No, no, no. This is what you should tell people at salvation. Hey, I'm God. I love you. Had a plan for you since you were formed in your mother's womb. Plan to prosper you, not to harm you. You know that whole thing? That was me. Um, I want to use you. I have a huge plan for you. Everything you've planned up until this point, that was nice. You ready to die? You ready to die to your flesh? You ready to die to your wants? You ready to die to your preferences? Are you ready to die to your personality? This is who I am mm, before me. And I don't want to change you. I want to develop you. 
That was the unrefined version of your personality. Now I want you to submit it to me. Is it really my will or is it really your will? Ready to die? And I found out that I can't truly serve Christ and be committed to convenience and comfort. I don't think a lot of people have told the church the truth. You coming to TC or your church is not enough. I'll go to church. Who cares? It didn't change you. I mean, if you, if you go somewhere and it doesn't change you, it was just exercise. And today I'm, I'm asking the church to decommit or uncuff from convenience because it's robbing us of our calling. My favorite scripture, anybody want to know my favorite scripture in the whole Bible? It's Philippians 2.13. This scripture has gotten me through every uncomfortable moment of my life to this day. And this is the grace of our God. For God is working in you. Giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. That means if I'm in the comfort zone and I want to step out of that comfort zone, I'm dealing with addictions and cycles and frustration and generational trauma. And I'm dealing with hurt. I'm dealing with the mistake I made. I'm dealing with all this stuff. God says, just bring it to me. I know it'll be a little uncomfortable. And I know it probably won't be convenient because, yeah, I'm going to take you through some steps to really help you. You're going to have to confess to somebody. You might need some counseling. You might have to serve some people. But I'm going to help you walk over. But I will give you both the desire and the power to do what pleases me. That means I don't ever have to go in anything thinking I already have to have it to complete it. How did I become a pastor? Stepping out of my comfort zone. And God saying, I'll give you both the desire and the power to do what pleases me. Today I stand here because I got out of convenience and I, I'm comfortable doing music. I'm comfortable in the studio. I'm comfortable directing behind the scenes. I started out as the sound man. I was doing everything from back there and God said, great. You ready to die? Come on from the sound booth and I'm going to make you comfortably uncomfortable. Do you think that it's convenient to prepare a message every week? I mean, it happens if I'm sick, if me and my wife are not seeing eye to eye, if one of my kids has autism, it does not matter. God said, but I've equipped you for what I've called you to do. If you make a decision that you're not gonna live in the comfort zone, and today I'm calling the church I just feel like there's God's just trying to reach down and pull some people out of everything that's been convenient. It's been convenient for you to rely on those same six scriptures you've had since 1972. And God said, I want to give you fresh oil. That means more time reading, more time waiting on me. Or are you going to allow this new wine that I want to give you to go into old wine skins? And it's going to end up wasting the whole thing. This generation needs you. But you're so comfortable. I'm trying to give you a burden for the next 10 years. But you won't even make time for me at breakfast. Church, everyone who's been cuffed to convenience. Today is the day that we uncuff. If that's you anywhere in the building, watching online, there's an area in your life that you know you've been cuffed to convenience. You've not fully been walking in your calling. You've been in the comfort zone. I want you to, to, to just make a step of faith. Wherever you are, watching at home, in, 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 on the track, if you're, if you're with your kids on the playground, it don't matter. Stand up for me right now. Just, this is not for me to see. This is for God to see. You're making a faith move right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. And there are tons of people lying right now. <laughs> so at the end of the day, like, at... at this ain't about me. When the truth comes and you do not recognize the truth, you cannot be set free. <laughs> so
So there will be people asking God, why didn't you do what you said you was going to do? It wasn't because he didn't do nothing. It's because when Nathan came, <laughs> you said, that ain't, nah, that ain't for me. That's for y'all. Okay, cool. I'm just letting you know today. God's giving you a chance to uncuff. Would you take the, 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 the position of surrender right now all over this world? Father, there's nothing I can do or say in my power. But your word says <laughs> that you will give us both the power and the desire to do what pleases you. Today, God, we've been cuffed to convenience. And Father, we have, we have set our lives up to be too comfortable in areas that you may be calling us out and trying to make our calling blossom. So today, I'm praying for every one of my brothers and sisters. I'm asking you, do what you did to me this week. Allow me to make a fresh commitment to you that whatever you say, wherever you call me, whatever you want me to do, Father God, here I am. I'm your servant. And I will allow my commitment and my conduct to be congruent. Father, I thank you for doing the core work that needs to happen right now. Where there's pain where there's hurt, where there's trauma, where there's things that, that we develop, Father God, to just be able to make it. God, all of those areas that are no longer serving us, God, I'm asking you to expose them right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that you're showing us the roots of things right now. Come on. I need you to begin to ask the Holy Spirit. Show me, God. Show me every area that I've been cuffed to convenience, Father. Whether it's in my eating, whether it's in my habits, whether it's in my talk, whether it's in my work. Father God, whether it's in my parenting, in my business, Father God, I thank you right now, Father, that people in your presence are becoming uncuffed. God, I'm asking right now that we would wait on you. That we would take the timer off of what you're doing in our life, God. And we would actually allow you to do the miracle inside of us that may take some time. I bind the spirit, Father God, that makes us feel like we've missed our moment. Yep, there it is. I bind the spirit of comparison that tries to make us think. That if we don't see something moving right now, somehow we missed it. God, I thank you that this idea of convenience is not from you. And you would make us embrace confronting our comfort, God. God, I don't want to tie this up in a bow acting like everything's done. I'm asking you, Father God, right now to start the work. Uh, yeah just tell God you can start the work you can you can start it on me you can start start God I'm here I'll do whatever you say start the work we're uncuffing from convenience today oh God I feel your presence and for everybody that was about to give up <laughs> God's saying my promises are still true my promises always come true Not depending on me But relying on you Your mercies are new every day So what's your response? I will trust you Sing that Your promises always come true Not depend He's giving you the desire and the power your mercy is new every day, so I will trust. Just say that again. I will trust you. Say, I will trust. Come on, hands lifted right now, because that's what it's going to take to give up convenience. You're going to have to trust the Creator. I this job ain't serving me right now this relationship is on my nerve but God is saying trust me I'm the creator I'm the one that will curate it somebody say hey I feel God starting to do a work right now on the inside of his people all over the world we're uncuffing from everything that's been comfortable and convenient come on we're gonna lift that up your promises always come true lift that up and believe the God say Believe it by faith. God, it's on your word. Hey. Come on, somebody respond and say,
this is us. Come on. He will renew your strength. He's doing the work. So wait a Tell your soul. Wait on the Lord. Your mind, will, and emotions. You're bringing it together, wait God. You're never when I want you, but you're right on time, somebody. He will renew your strength. Somebody say. Today, God's starting to do something. I see, I see you on a surgery table. <laughs> and God's starting to do the work on your heart. This is what you've been needing all year. And God says, here I am. I'm going to do the work. But don't get up while I'm operating. This is open heart surgery. Don't jump up and try to be in everything. Don't try to move like you was moving yesterday. Let me heal you. Let me make you whole. And the first way to be made whole is you invite the great physician into your life. His name is Jesus. And I'm, I'm one of the most broken people in the world without Christ. And, and, and what I did was I invited him in. And he came into my weakness and he transformed me. He, he took me from being somebody who was a liar, a manipulator, addicted to pornography, had all kinds of very dark things in my heart, was trying to figure out life from culture and Christianity, and I didn't know what to do. So my, 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 my commitment to Christ and, and my actual conduct was not congruent. I was, I was double-minded in all my ways. I was unstable. I, I was hurting people in the process. There were all kinds of things. And when I came to God, I said, Michael, this ain't going to be comfortable or convenient, but it's just, it's going to allow you to reach your calling. And I said, sign me up because this other crap ain't working. I'm tired of this. And some of y'all have that same sentiment. You're tired of how it has been going. You're tired of feeling like the weight is all on you. You're tired of trying to come up with a plan and it falling through. And God says, could you give me a try? I want to transform you. I want to take all of your pieces and turn it into a masterpiece, but you're the only one that can let him in. <laughs> so today, I believe this message, <laughs> many people have not given their life to Christ because you didn't <laughs> want to be inconvenienced. And today I'm just telling you, convenience is such an illusion. <laughs> God's saying, I want you to reach your calling. So invite me in. And I'll take what you have and do way more with it. If that's you. And you want your eternity to be satisfied, situated, stable, aligned. Today, I want to give you the opportunity to receive the greatest gift. His name is Jesus Christ. I need the church to start praying because there's people right now. There's years of comfort. That's a warring because some of y'all are like, I'm not fake. If I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it fully. And you've been at that place where you've been warned because you know God's calling you, but you don't want to do it if you're not going to be for real. And God said, today is the day of salvation. This is the moment I've aligned the whole thing. Don't leave this moment. He's waited on you. <laughs> and today, God wants to give you the opportunity to come into a relationship, a covenant with him. So if that's you on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. I don't care where you are. I don't care who's around you. You're going to have to be a little uncomfortable and be bold because God wants you to claim him. He wants you to see uh, his goodness as you display his goodness to others. So one, you're making the greatest decision of your life. Two, I'm telling you, I'm proud of you. But more than that, your name is about to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Three, if you want to give your life to Christ, shoot your hand up all over the world right now. I see and know that there are hands going up all over. We're going to clap in a minute. But we're about to pray now for the benefit of all of those hands. I believe there's thousands of people. This year, how many people have given their life to Christ this year through Transformation Church? How many? 15,000 plus people. Oh, y'all, I don't know what y'all came to do. 15,000 people? And that's the only ones that, that we know of. God is doing a work. 
but it's happening one person, one soul, one life at a time. And today is your day. At Transformation Church, we're family. Nobody prays alone. So I want everybody to pray this prayer for the benefit of those who are coming to Christ. Everybody say, God, thank you for sending Jesus to uncuff me. Today, I'm asking you to be my Lord and Savior. I believe you lived, you died, and you rose again with all power to uncuff me from all of the chains. Change me. Renew me. Transform me. I'm yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can we celebrate? Oh, y'all better come on. I said, TC, can we celebrate what God is doing all over the world right now? Hallelujah. So listen. So listen. Now keep that going, y'all. Y'all stay right there. Stay right there. If you just made that decision, I want you to text the number on the screen. And I got a message from God. He loves you. He needs you. He wants to use you. Are you ready to die? Uh, this journey's not about to be convenient, but it's going to pull out your calling. And you're going to make a difference in this earth. When you die, there will be a void because you did something on this earth. And I'm believing that for the entire body of Christ. That means we're uncuffing from convenience. Next week, y'all, I'm going to give you a breather. Because I've been on some of y'all throats for three weeks. Okay? I think I'm going to give you a breather. But next week, you don't want to miss it. I'm not going to tell you what I'm talking about because it's still incubating. But um, next week's going to change us forever. We're going to get uncuffed from something else that's going to help us. Go back and watch all three of these messages this week. It's going to prepare you for next week. Meditate on the word. Take one scripture that God may highlight to you and just go study that in the Bible. This is not about consumption. It's about concentration. So there may be something that God illuminates to you. I want you to ask, Holy Spirit, what are you trying to say to me through this message? What are you trying to show me? Don't be David. Passionate about something that you going through but can't see it because you're so aware but not self-aware wow, does anybody feel like they're growing right now <laughs> guess what growth does hurts ain't nobody said growth is comfortable but if you wait on it <laughs> just wait on Lord Wait on. Somebody got, where's that mic? He will. So wait. Come on, just one more second. Say, wait on the Lord.
don't mind waiting. No. No. Come on. I don't mind waiting. Come on, if that's you, if that's you. I don't, I don't mind waiting. I don't mind, don't oh. mind. All right. Stay in an attitude of worship this week. <laughs> worship is the atmosphere where he changes your heart. This week, this week, this message is going to hit like on Tuesday. You know how you get something and then you don't feel it till later? That's this one. You're going to be getting up on Tuesday morning and that thing going to hit you like a ton of bricks and God's like, oh, you're doing all of that out of convenience. He's going to allow you to examine your week, your relationships, your commitments. And he's going to call us out of comfort. I warned you. Hi, my name is Nathan. Just want to let you know that how David ended up in this situation is not how you have to end up. Your family doesn't have... So the saddest part about this story, because I'm leaving this story, you, you can go read it. But that baby that they had died. The legacy was cut off because of his commitment to comfort and convenience. If you don't uncuff from comfort and convenience for your sake, would you just please do it? For the sake of the next generation. It, it, it may not affect you. You may I love your life. But somebody else's life may get cut short. Because of how you live now. God will wait on you. And will let you. Uncuff us from comfort and convenience. Have your way in us. In Jesus name. We agree. We expect. we expect amen let's put our hands together until next week go out and live a transformed life i love y'all